Amen. I'm telling you, good stuff. If we can have results like that, I'll let all of you shoot me, you know? That's fantastic. <laughs> I love it. If you have your Bibles, turn to Philippians chapter 3. Uh, we are still uh, in our series on the seven pillars. Uh, and we are, this is kind of the last one on discipleship. Uh, and then we're going to move on uh, to the next pillar next week. But we, we, we've talked last week about pressing on. Pressing on, living in a life of following Christ in a way that we don't grow content just to just to just make it. But we want to press on. We want to press on. And how in the book of Acts, uh, the scripture knows that, that they were first called Christians there. And as you look into it and you get into it, you, you discover that it wasn't a name they came up with for themselves. But it was a name that the religious leaders of the day came up and gave it to them. Because this group of people were coming together and they, they kind of said, well, they're little Christ. They're like that guy, Jesus. So they're, they're, they're you know, a Jesus group, Jesus party, the I-A-N makes it party. So you're in the party of Jesus, almost like you're Republican, you're Democrat, well now there's a Jesus party. And, and that's kind of where that came from. And it was given somewhat derogatory, it was given somewhat flippantly and, uh, and, and whatnot. And so here's our, our, our premise of last week was simply Jesus didn't call us to be Christians, he called us to be disciples. That's what we talked about. We took some time getting into that. And, and this was a group of people that changed everything. They were from all different groups coming together. It was unprecedented, and they needed to come up with a new term and a new category for them, so they called them Christians. And, and how today, when you're out and you tell someone, hey, I'm a Christian, that you get a lot of different reactions. Because we've defined Christian as a very different things. And, and for some, oh, I'm a Christian means I've prayed the prayer and asked Jesus to be the Lord of my life. And, or I've been baptized or something like that. Or I go to church and, oh, yeah, I help out with this ministry or that ministry. I'm a Christian. And yet for some people, when they hear the word Christian, all they think of is you're judgmental. You're hateful. You, uh, you, you, you know, you're, you're, you're one of those people. Uh, that, that's the idea of it. And, and, you know, you can see these things. Okay, you're a Christian. You pray before your meals. That's great. That's good. But here's the thing. The word Christian, the term Christian was a label that the world gave us. Jesus never called us to be Christians. He called us to be disciples. And it's important that we set that apart. It's important that we understand that because a Christian will try to get away with some things that a disciple never would. Jesus said that you'll know you are my disciples by the way that you love one another. Not you'll love them because they first loved you, but because you love them, period. Because we have the Spirit of God within us, and God is love. So a Christian will say, well, pastor, you don't understand. You don't understand what they did. You don't understand how they hurt me. You don't understand, you know, what the, the impact it's made on my life or my, my finances. I mean, he just, he, he, just, he fired me. And so I have this, this issue with this guy. And now my home is this. And now my, a disciple will say, Lord, this is the hardest thing you've ever asked me to do. But I pray you'll help me. You will change my heart so that I can love them like you love me. So that I can forgive them like you've forgiven me. See, we can all be Christians, but to love like Jesus loves, I think we have to be more. We have to be more. Matthew 5.16 says, In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. You ever have you know, the idea of uh, Christians that live undetected? You know, they're, they're just like spy Christians. They're undercover Christians, double O seven seven seven. You know, I mean, they they just the people. You know, and and the thing is, you don't really realize. You don't know until you see them at church or you you see them somewhere, and they go, "Oh, I'm a Christian." You go, you're, you're a Christian? I couldn't tell by the way you talk or the way you live or the way you act or the way you carry yourself. You are you're sneaky. And I mean, is that what God's called us to? He's called us to let our light shine. He says, "You don't light a candle and put it under a basket." But you let it out. Let it shine in the whole room. We're a city set on a hill. Why? So all can see and come out of the darkness and into the light. That's what he's called us to. And it's amazing because some people see at the gym or the office and you can't tell by the way they live or treat people. But then you see them at church and you think, did they get lost? Wow. See, a disciple is salt and light. 
There's something different about the way they live and carry themselves and love and treat people that makes you ask who loves like that and who forgives like that and who is generous like they're generous, who puts others before themselves like that. You know, I've met Christians and I've met people in the Jesus party, but I've never met someone like that. That's what God has called us to. That's what Jesus wants us to live. And you let the way that you live connect the dots for others who watch you. And the world is watching. But you let the way that you live and the way that you love connect the dots for them to see your Father in heaven. See, you can be a Christian, and I want to be clear on this. You can be a Christian and go to heaven. I believe that. I believe if you have asked Jesus into your heart as your Lord and Savior, you can go to heaven. But I'm telling you, I don't want to walk across the line and have Jesus go, you made it by that much. I want to step across the line and have him say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. That's what we want. That's what we've got to be. And I think God will say to us all that there's times you could have been a lot but you hid it under a basket. You could have had flavor and influenced a room, but you didn't, and those moments were lost. So we challenge you to press on to discipleship and not just settle for being a Christian. And the thing is this, none of us are there yet. Look at your neighbor and say, you're not there yet. Look at your other neighbor and say, not even you. None of us have arrived, but we've all been invited to this journey of following Jesus. And there's days we do it right, and there's days we stumble, but get up and keep moving forward. That's the key. We've got to keep moving forward. And he says, forgetting what is behind, we must press on. Now, now here we're going to jump into the, to the, to, to this morning's. I'm having a problem talking. And for my line of work, that's a problem. <laughs> Let's pray. Father, take this word. Take this word today, God, and drive it into our hearts. Father, do not let this seed land on hard soil and be plucked away by the birds. Don't let this seed, God, land on hearts that want to change, that want to be different, but are not willing to invest in it and have the cares of this life choke it out. Father, let it land on good soil today. And let your Holy Spirit come and prepare to break up the fallow ground of our lives, God. So that we are not content, but we are hungry for more of you. And let that seed take root and bear fruit in us. Thank you for being our Savior. There's nobody like you. In your name, amen. Several of the scriptures, when you look at scriptures, talk about our, our walk of faith, our walk with Christ, about being a race. It's pictured as a race. And, and, and it's a race that we run. Uh, now, I have, I have never really been... A runner. I played sports all through high school, played baseball all the way up through college. Uh, I love sports. When I first came here, we had a softball team. And I, man, I love, I love softball. I love playing. I love the, the competition. I don't like losing. Uh, I, I don't. I think losing stinks. Um, and I think if you're going to play, you play to win. And, uh, and so I only played about four or five games because they just wanted to have fun. And they're throwing the balls in the left field. And I'm thinking, what are you doing? You know? And I just thought, I better go pray more. And, uh, and what, but I, I did. I, I love it. But here's the thing. I am not a runner. I cannot run to save my life. I don't know what happened. I don't know where it went. I just, I've not really ever been someone since college who could ever really run. And, and one day I decided, and I'm, I'm, I'm looking on Facebook and I'm seeing people post, oh, ran four miles and 14 minutes and 37 seconds. I thought, man, that's cool. I want to do that. And I drive down the road and I see people going with their headbands and they got the things and they're going. And I just think, that just looks so cool. I want to be one of those people. And, and I want to, I'm going to run. I'm just going to do it. I'm just going to do it. And I talked to people who were runners. They said, listen, when you start out running, you just got to know it's just going to hurt. It's going to be miserable, but don't give up. Keep pressing on. And so I would go out in our neighborhood and I would runish. You know, and I, I, I would run and I would, I had this loop I did and I would come back. My feet would hurt so bad. I mean, just so bad. By the end of, I'm walking on my tiptoes around the house, you know, and, and I just, I would do it. And I said, I talked to him. You sure it's supposed to hurt like this? And, oh yeah, you just keep pushing, keep pushing. And so I'd run and I'm doing this thing and I'm thinking my times were horrible. So I wasn't posting anything, but I'm running. I'm trying to do all this thing. And one morning I had been out running the night before. I got up the next morning. I swing my feet out of bed. My feet hit the floor. Pain shot up both my legs and I literally just collapsed. And I thought, it's not supposed to feel like this. 
And so I made a doctor's appointment. I went, I had two bone spurs per foot. Basically, one was straight out of the heel. So every time, boom, I'm like, ow, ow, you know. And so I went back to those people who said, push, and I punched them right in the face. No, I didn't do that. I didn't, I didn't do that. That's not true. That's not true. But I had bone spurs. But it helped me understand something about myself. And everything in life will teach you something. This is what it helped me understand. When people ask, are you a fight or flight? I'm a fight because I cannot run. <laughs> I'm serious. If something went down, if something happened, and I ran till I was tired, they could probably still just throw a rock and hit me. Uh, I, I, I could. Now, I can get on the elliptical and go all day, and that's what I tend to do. I will, I will go and I'll do the, my weights, and I have a little thing, routine that I do, and I'll go up and I'll get up on the ellipt elliptical, and, you know, you got the feet and the thing, and I kind of get that, that oom bop song. Oom bop da bop da bop oom bop and I just, I just, I, you know, I'm just going. I'm just going. And I can do that all day long. Can't run for nothing, but I can elliptical like a champion. And so if you're ever out somewhere, ma'am, you need to hear this. If you're ever out somewhere and you see me walking out of a building like this singing Oombop, something's going down and you should probably run. Because that's just the best that I can do. I'm just not a runner. I've never been a runner. But we're called to run. We're called by Jesus to run in this race. And Philippians 3 was our ending verse last week. It's our foundation verse this week. And it uses the idea of a race to teach us about the journey of faith that all of us are on. And Paul uses to describe it, his own spiritual experience. And he gives us some fundamental things for spiritual growth. And here's the thing. Our last one of disciples, I want it to be this. As disciples, we have to be growers. We have to grow. Continue to move forward. Continue to learn. Continue to be taught. Continue to be shaped. Now Paul says this is how to get in spiritual shape so that we can run the race that is before us. He says Philippians 3, 12 to 14. Not that I have already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. See, to be the disciple that Jesus has called us to be, we need to be followers that continue to be growing in Him. Are there any people who are competitive in here? You're, yeah, I, you know, I, I was, when I was younger, I was much more competitive. I think the older you get, the slower you get, the less competitive I get in some areas. Uh, but we're still competitive. I lived at uh, Valley Forge. That's where I went to school. And where from Valley Forge to my house in Cumberland, Virginia, was six and a half hours. And so whenever we would have a break, a fall break or anything like that, I would drive home. And whenever I would drive home, I would have the West Johnson 100. And the West Johnson 100 meant that you had to pass 100 cars from the time that you left college to the time that I got to my driveway. And if I was passed by a car, I lost a spot. And so I, you know, I love, I, I love the, the whole competitive thing. And so we're going, we're driving, and it's just, this is awesome. I, you know, I'm, the, I'm the kind of guy that I get on the treadmill or the, uh, the elliptical, and sometimes it's Sierra. She'll get on beside me, and I look, and if I'm at, at 10 and 5, and she's at 10 at 6, and I got to go to 10 and 7. And then she looks over, and she's just bad as I am. So she's at... She's got to bump it up one. And so we end up doing this max incline, max resistant, and neither one of us are going to give up. We're just sitting there, and I'm like, I've had a heart attack. This is your fault, you know. And, and I'm just, I'm doing everything I can to get her to quit. She's like, we all die sometime, you know. And it, it's just crazy. And eventually, we just kind of look over. We both look like we're going to fall off. I'm like, it's a draw. She goes, it's a draw, you know. So, I mean, but we get competitive, and, and, and I think that there's this challenge. But here's some things I've learned about, about running and I, things I've learned about, about winning, and it's this. You aren't going to win a race you're not in. You're not going to win a race that you aren't in. Number two is you need the right attitude. You've got to have the right attitude. Attitude makes a difference. And number three is you have to give it the right effort. Right? If you're going to win, if you want to be a winner, if you want to overcome and you want to accomplish and you want to see God moving, you've got to give it the right effort. So first point today is simply this. To grow as a disciple, you've got to be in 
the race. Now, I know that might sound overly simple. Many of you are, have, are saved and you follow Christ for many years of your life. But I, I think that there might be people who are trying to run the race that they've never really entered. I meet a lot of folks that want to go to heaven and ask them, well, how do you get to heaven? And they say, oh, you got to be a good person and you got to be kind to one another and, and you got to, you know, be loving. And they, they list Christian qualifications or Christian characteristics. They list the fruit of the Spirit, but, 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 they, but they aren't really in the race yet. They're doing good things, but we can't earn our way to heaven and they aren't even in the race. It's do you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior? And that's what I would ask everyone here today. Have you asked Jesus to come into your heart, to be the Lord of your life? Have you surrendered your will and your day and your tomorrow and your all to him and said, Jesus, I am yours. My life is yours. Are you in the race this morning? We can come, sing, we can clap, we can stand, we can give, we can throw something into play, but none of these things are what gets you in the race. And it really has to come to have you ask him to be your Savior. Paul even thought that he was doing everything that he needed to do in order to please God. Before he became Paul, he was Saul. And he heard this rebellious group that was coming against the teaching that he had been taught his whole life, that he lived. And, and later on in Scripture, he says, I lived that life flawlessly. And he took it upon himself to travel and to persecute and to arrest and to kill these people who were, who were tearing down the image of what he thought God wanted all of us to be and all of us to do. He thought he was doing the right thing. He was dedicated. He was sincere. He was passionate about it. He was just wrong. Philippians 3, 4 through 8, Paul gives us his resume. He says, though I myself have reasons for such confidence, if someone else thinks they have reason to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day, the people uh, uh, of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law, a Pharisee. As for zeal, persecuting the church, and as for righteousness based on the law, faultless. But whatever gains were to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I've lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ. That's a guy saying, I want to be in the race. All the stuff that I did that I thought was so good and so right and so healthy and was going to get me in, didn't and wouldn't. You got to know Jesus. Being sincere and trying hard is good, but it not, it's not what makes you right with God. And Paul in verse 12, speaking of his effort and his walk with Christ, but he clarifies that behind the effort is the foundation that he was first apprehended by Jesus. I love that. He says, I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Now, the translations, various uh, different translations you may have might say, uh, possess me or lay hold on me. And, and that's what he's talking about. It's the same word that's used in Mark 9 18 when it says that the spirit would seize the boy and throw him to the ground. It's that same word. It's saying, Jesus just got me. Anybody ever watch the show Cops? One person. A couple of them. You, you watch the show Cops. You know what I never see on the show Cops? I never see them chasing somebody in a stolen car. They crash the car. They get out. They run. I never see the policeman trying to corral them into the back of the squad car. <laughs> Have you ever seen that? The guy's running and they're going, this way, this way, please, this way, this way. No, 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 no. They're taking hold of people. <laughs> they're possessing them. They are they are laying hands on. I mean, they are captain. They're, they're apprehending. That's the word. You see it, and the guy comes around the corner, a cop just, he jumps on him, dragging him, flipping him, handcuffing him, putting him into the back of the car. That's what Paul is saying. He says, listen, guys, I was going on my way doing what I thought was the right thing to do for God, and God met me, and God took hold of me. God apprehended my life that day on the road to Damascus, and he put me in this race. Paul, for his part, was headed to Damascus to persecute Christians. But God met him on the road. He took hold of him, and he turned him around so that Saul became Paul, and Paul now began to serve Jesus. He later calls it the upward call of God. And for many, they believe that that's salvation. We are saved because we call out to God, and God called out to us. Scripture says that in John 14 that no man comes through the Father but what? 
but through Jesus and the work of Christ on the cross. Nobody. And see, you think, oh, my goodness, my life's a mess, and I just need to reach out and cry out to God. What you don't know is God's been calling you. In any sporting event, a coach can tell a player, come off the bench and get in the game. And that player's going to go into the game, and he's going to play to win. He's going to play to please his coach. God's put us in the game. That's what it is. Our life of faith didn't start in the weakness of a human decision to follow God, but with God's powerful and effectual calling and the laying hold of your life. And that's why one of my life mottos is my life is not my own. It's just not mine. I'll go wherever you tell me to go. I'll do whatever you tell me to do. I'll say whatever you ask me to say, God. Our lives are not my own. And that is why you read, I've been apprehended. I've been seized. I've been taken hold of. I'm a slave to Christ, he says in Galatians. He took me. He put me in the race. He has called me onward, and he's called me upward. You want to grow in your walk with God? You want to grow as a disciple that stems from a definite awareness of being apprehended by Jesus. See, as long as I see my life as mine, I'm going to fall short of what he desires for me. Because his ways are better than my ways. And his thoughts are better than my thoughts. To be a disciple, you got to get in the race. Look at your neighbor and say, you got to get in the race. Look at your other neighbor and say this. To grow as a disciple, you've got to have the right attitude. Amen. I, uh, our, our pastoral staff, whenever we hear of someone having surgery or whatnot, we always try to go and meet with them and pray with them before surgery, and it's, it's awesome. And most of the time, 26 years, uh, it's always been a great, great, great experience, you know. Uh, this past Friday, one of our members was having surgery, and uh, they had to get there like at 5 in the morning. I thought, I don't even know if Jesus is up at 5 in the morning, you know. But I did. I got there at 5, and I get to the place, and it wasn't the hospital. It was like a medical center. And uh, I go in, and the lady in the front says, yes, who are you? So I'm Pastor Wes Johnson. I'm here to see so-and-so. And, uh, and they say, oh, right in the back. And the nurse comes, or one of the nurses leads me back, and I go to the room. And, and he's, he's lying. His wife is there, the daughter there. Just beautiful family, beautiful family. And so I'm talking with them. And the nurse, she's this little redhead lady about this tall. And she's in there, and she says, very polite, she goes, oh, I see you have guests. Uh, I'll come back and do my stuff later. So she goes out, and we're just, we're talking. We're talking about the surgery, how long it's going to take, what his recovery is going to look like. Just enjoying some time together. It's great. Then she comes back in. And she comes in, and she picks up her little clipboard, and she's standing there, and she begins to ask him questions. And they always say, you know, are you comfortable answering these questions with everyone in the room? And I say, hey, I'll step out. It's no big deal. He said, no, 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 don't worry about it. So she's answering the questions, and at one point in the thing, she stops, and she measures his calf with a tape, which I thought, that's weird. And, uh, and she says, well, this is for your stockings that we're going to give you for after surgery. And I said, oh, that's great time. I hope they match his, his Halloween outfit. <laughs> well, he gets the giggling. And he can't stop giggling. And the nurse gets mad. And she literally, she turns. I try to be good, folks. I try. She turns around, takes the clipboard, puts it on the thing, walks up, pulls the screen, turns around, slams the screen. And then she's standing on the other side of the screen, me to the pulpit, talking to the doctor. And you can hear her saying, I cannot do my job with those people in there. I can't get anything there. And so I just lovingly said, we can hear you. <laughs> and it immediately goes stone cold quiet. And I said to my brother, I said, brother, let me pray with you so that our nurse can come in and she can take professional care of you. And I, I prayed with him. And on the way out, I opened the curtain and she's standing still this close with her back to our room like this. And I just went over and I put both arms around her and I hugged her and I said, I am so sorry if we messed up you doing your job. And I hope you have a better day. Well, I, 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 I just... I just yeah, and, I, and I left. They said she was awesome for the rest of the day. Listen, attitude counts. Attitude matters. You know, you've got to run the race with the right attitude. What is your attitude towards your pursuit of God? Philippians 3.15 says that we should have this mind. Some translations say the view of things. Because attitude makes a difference. 
Paul's been converting now for 25 years when he wrote the book of Philippians. And there's no question that Paul is one of the best to ever follow Jesus. But when you read his writings, look at what he over and over and over he says. He reveals his attitude and his mindset. And it's this, not that I have already obtained or been made perfect. I don't consider myself to have yet taken hold of. Twice, he says, you've got to press on. He's still reaching forward 25 years, and he doesn't see himself as having arrived. And the carryaway is this. I don't care how long you've served, we're not there yet. We're just not there yet. We need to keep pressing. We need to keep reaching. We've got to get into the race, and we've got to run with the right attitude. You see, we can't reach a place that we say, oh, I'm going to stop growing now. I'm going to stop serving. I'm going to stop giving. I've served my time, and, and now it's time for someone else to go and to do it all. That's not right. Until we step from this life to the next, we are in the race. You've got to be in the race, and you've got to have the right attitude. You see, the idea of discipleship as a lifelong process is important for us for a couple of reasons. One is because we tend to want quick fixes and easy answers to difficult problems. Now, I'm going to say something. I want you to understand me. I want you to hear my heart because if you don't hear it correctly, you're going to be angry at me. And if you're angry at me, I want you to be because you heard me. Here's the thing. Sometimes we take years to make a mess. And then we want to come to church, have somebody pray in us, anoint us with oil, have an emotional experience, and then be delivered from it all in a moment. Now listen, sometimes God does. God is a miracle-working God. The, uh, the little baby that we played, actually both the babies, one's home now, happy with mom and dad. <laughs> Loving that. And the other, uh, the other um, they, they did one test on two they had said that Duke University is where the baby is now. The baby's hope. Baby hope. Um, and Duke wasn't comfortable doing the surgery because there was leaking valves. There was a hole in the valve. There was all sorts of mess with the heart. They ran a test, um, and they discovered that the one hole in the heart has completely healed up. And, yeah. And the doctor, secular doctor now, said, I think this is a miracle. So, I'm t listen, sometimes... God intervenes in things, and they're powerful, and they're amazing, and they're anointed, and they're, and they're that. You can come to the altar struggling with something, and God can say, no more, and it's, it's gone. And you can walk away from an altar and not have that issue, not have that wrestling, not have, but that's not every time. Sometimes God says, listen, you took two years to get into this mess. We're going to take a journey out of it. I'm going to get you out of it. But you got to stay in the race, and you got to have the right attitude, and you got to be willing to learn what I'm trying to teach you. So he goes out of this thing. And I, listen, I believe in the power of the Holy Spirit, and I believe that miracles still happen today. I believe it. I believe it. I believe it. But sometimes we just want to go, and we want it fixed. And sometimes that's just not what happens. God says you got to run the race. You gotta have the right attitude. It takes us on a journey. And I've had people tell me, you just gotta let go and let God. All your problems are flesh, and if you just live in the Spirit, it'll be easy. Well, here's the thing my experience is that life in the Spirit is better. Life in the Spirit is better. My marriage is better because of the Spirit of a living God. My, 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 my relationship, my children is better. I think every aspect of your life can be better because of the presence of God, but that does not always mean easy. Is that okay to say that? It's not always easy. Man, I, I don't think the scriptures would say that. I think Ephesians 6, 12 says this. It's not easy. He says, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. That's not easy. He says in 1 Timothy 4, 7, have nothing to do with godly myths and old wives' tales. Rather, train yourself to be godly. And train there gives us this idea of working at it and working at it and working at it. Listen, have you ever had a favorite player? Uh, I'll say, well, well, this would be great with the skins. Um, no, I'm going to be good. <laughs> have you ever had a favorite football player who just was the man and then he retired? And then you saw them like years later on TV and they don't look the same? Do you know what I'm saying? When I was a kid, Fernando Valenzuela 
was a pitcher for the Los Angeles Dodgers. And when he first came out, he was the man. I mean, I love baseball. No one could hit him. This guy was unbelievable, unbelievable. But a couple of years later, he was about the size of a truck. <laughs> he did. He did. I don't know what happened. Well, I do know what happened. But he could barely get his leg up to throw the ball. It was, it was terrible. And the whole career really impacted his whole career. And here, here, here's the thing. You don't stay in shape for the rest of your life because of former training. All right? Are, are, are you with me there? you got to keep working at it. And the same thing is with our spirituality. It's a race. It's a lifelong pursuit. Discipleship is a journey that we can continue to grow when we see it as a lifelong journey of growth and discipleship. I can't say, oh, when I was 20 to 30, man, I gave God my all. And then from 30 on, I'm just going to sit back and relax. I mean, you know, spiritually, that doesn't work. You don't stay spiritually strong like that. You've got to be in the race. You've got to have the right attitude. And another thing is this. It's going to enable us to be great and patient with each other. We need that, don't we? If everything was a quick fix and everything was an easy answer, you'd be so frustrated with people who are struggling. Because God saved you from something and now you see them wrestling with something and we're saying, well, just stop it. Just stop it. Just don't do that. Just don't think like that anymore. Just don't act like that anymore. They're still broken inside. You know, you would not look, you would not look. Well, I'll get to that. Paul, after 25 years of his race, says he still has not arrived yet. It's not that I've taken hold of it. Not that I've obtained yet. So I... I press on. Galatians 6, 2 says, carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. Listen, it takes children years to grow to maturity, and you don't expect more of them than they're capable of at their age. I don't look at my two-year-old and say, well, you're old enough to be hungry. You ought to be old enough to cook your own food. <laughs> right? But do you ever do that with each other? You've been serving Jesus for three weeks now. Why are you still wrestling with that? I don't know, maybe I'm human. Maybe I haven't obtained yet. Maybe I'm still trying to press on and learning how to be in the race and how to run with the right attitude. But we can come and carry one another's burdens. I think the key thing is that we and they are actively a part of a growth process. We must always be moving forward. And if anyone could have thought that they would have arrived, it could have been Paul. But in 2 Timothy, you read chapter 4, he's in prison, he's facing execution, and he tells Timothy, bring my coat and my books because there's still stuff to learn and there's still stuff to do. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Paul's heart of moving forward is seen when he says, forget the past, reach forward to the future and press on in your present because your past is past. You got to own it. But move forward. Don't stay captive to it. Now, I'm not saying don't learn from your mistakes and don't learn from your history. But history is just that. It's where we launch from. It's not where we live. You can learn from it, about where we're at in the present and where we need to grow to move forward. We should examine ourselves. Scripture calls us to do that. But we need to grow forward. He says, reach forward everything we do. Everything we do. You say, Pastor, I don't know me everything we do. Yes, everything we do. How we conduct ourselves in our families and in public, how we spend our time and our money, how we serve the Lord, all should be done with the mindset of, I'm going to stand before God one day and be given an account for my life, and I want to be pleasing to Him. Not by the skin of your teeth, but well done, well done, thou good and thou faithful servant. We got to press towards the goal. In verse 12, Paul says, I have not obtained this. I'm not perfect. But in verse 15, he says, while I'm not perfect, I am mature. And it's good to understand that. Philippians 3.15, let all who are spiritually mature agree on these things. If you disagree on some point, I believe God will make it plain to you. We must hold on to the progress we already have made. This mature view is, is, is this. None of us have arrived, but we can arrive one day. And we need to keep moving forward, and we need to keep growing. And Paul understands that not everyone's going to share the same attitude that he has because they're not mature yet. And to those who disagree with him, he simply says this. Stay teachable. God will show you. If you keep your hearts open, 
you desire to be in the race with the right attitude, God will show you how to grow. And in verse 16, he says, so that no one will mistake him to believe that you can just kind of, we've got to work at growing. And he means this, that wherever you're at, you need to keep living in obedience to the light that God has shown you and keep seeking him for more. I love that. Hold on to the progress we have made already. Listen, if God has set you free from something, don't go dabbling. If God has cleaned out your closet of junk, don't start throwing new junk in the closet. That's what he said. Don't lose ground. No one's going to win a race running backwards. Get in the race. Get the right attitude and keep pressing forward. If God's dealt with some stuff, don't slip back into it. When God's cleaned out some things, don't dirty it back up again. If you want to grow in the Lord, you have to have a teachable heart. And a teachable heart is humble and it can admit, I don't know and I was wrong. Be submissive to what God shows you. Number three and my final point, I'll wrap up with this. Well, you've got to give it the right effort. You got to give it the right effort. I know that some say God is sovereign and so we're just along for the ride and, and others will tell you it's all about you. And here's what I think. I don't think either one is right. I think they're both right. I think God is at work. In work. God is sovereign and God is God over everything. And God has a plan and his plans are what's going to be successful. And God is at work in us to get us in alignment with what he wants to do and his will and his plan. And so while God's working in me, I have a responsibility to work. Get in the race, run with the right attitude, and give it the best effort. Give it the right effort. An athlete is not going to win, uh, or an athlete who wins is not someone who just dabbles when it's convenient, but it's set in their heart and in their mind to run the race. And that impacts everything. It impacts what they do, how they eat, how they train. It impacts their lives. He keeps the goal in front of him. And so the questions I want to leave you with are this. Do I devote myself to knowing Christ and being like him in the same way that an athlete devotes himself to winning his event? And second one is, does knowing Christ and growing in him consume me or do I just dabble in it when it's convenient? If you want to grow, you've got to put your effort into it, not just occasionally, but all the time. Amen? Listen, get in the race. Get the right attitude and give it all you have. And let's run to win. Amen? Yeah. Holly, can I get you to bow your heads this morning? Listen, what is the Holy Spirit saying to you through this message? What is the Holy Spirit saying to you through this message? Are you in the race? Are you in the race or are you maybe here this morning and say, you know what, I kind of I kind of started coming to church because I realized something was missing. I kind of started coming to church because my life was falling apart and, and you know, I'm, I'm desperate and I'm, I'm just looking for help. I need God to help me. I need God to, to intervene. And, and here's the thing. That's great. God loves you and God is for you. And then God has purposes and plans for your life. But it's more than just being a good person and being kind to other people and being nice. It's about knowing him as Lord and as Savior. And if you're here today and you've never asked him into your heart as your Lord and Savior, before you leave this building today, I'm going to open up our altars. Before you leave, will you come and will you accept him as Lord and Savior? And it's very simple. It's ABC. Admit you're a sinner. All of us have sinned. All of us have fallen short. Paul, one of the greatest Christians to ever live, said, guys, listen, I haven't obtained it. I haven't reached it. I'm not there. We all make mistakes. We all stumble. But we can start with Christ all over again. And so before you leave, would you come and let us lead you in that prayer? Admit you're a sinner. Believe that Jesus died on a cross. And because he did, I can be set free from the things that bind me. I can be set free from the past that tries to hold me captive. And I can press on in Jesus because of the work that he's done. And then confess your sins to him. You don't need to tell me what you've done. That's not my business. But you can say, Father, I admit I'm a sinner and I have fallen short. And I ask forgiveness for every sin. I ask forgiveness, Lord God. I confess those to you. And will you come into my heart and be the Lord of my life and help me, God, to get in the race, to run with the right attitude, and to give it my best. And I'm telling you, man, there's something powerful about that. That's a miracle. That's the miracle right there. When our names are written down in the Lamb's Book of Life and I'm in the race then, God is with you. God is for you. And God will do it. Maybe you need to start there. 
as Jesus laid hold on you. For those of you that have been in the race for a while, has Jesus laid hold of you? And what I mean by that is, is, have we gotten casual in our pursuit of Christ? Have we got casual? Church and things have become calendar things and not a passion, a raw passion of there's no one who's loved me like Jesus has loved me. There's no one who's been to my life what Jesus has been to my life. He took hold of me. For Paul, it was on the road to Damascus. I don't know where it was to you, but he, he captured my heart right then. He captured it. I don't own it. My life is not my own. Can you say that today? My life is not mine. It is his. And so because none of us have arrived, I'm going to press on. I'm going to keep moving forward. I'm going to realize that there aren't easy answers and quick fixes. It's a journey. It's a race that we're in. And I'm going to be patient with you. And I'm going to ask that you be patient for me. Because all of us are in this thing together. And as John said earlier, we need brothers around us. We need people around us to help us. To encourage us to give it our heart. Give it our soul. And to give it our mind. You want to continue to be a disciple of Jesus Christ.